Welcome to Pod Songs, where we interview inspirational people in service to others as inspiration for a new song. Today's guest is Professor Steve Fuller, an American social philosopher in the field of science and technology. Jack, how you doing? Great, how are you doing? Yeah, yeah, I'm all right, I'm all right. Nice very... day today. Oh, sorry, what do you think? So you're looking very professional there. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know, how, like, I managed to figure it out, I think. Uh, I'm not usually very good at <laughs> all the tech stuff. Um, usually my sister does that, but she's not here anymore. No worries. Okay, great. And we're, And you're in Italy, is that right? Yeah, I am, yeah. In the south. Oh, wow, well, that's uh, lovely. Yeah, opposite the Amalfi Coast. So. Okay, well, yeah, I wouldn't mind being there instead of London, to be honest. But... <laughs> well, it has its advantages. <laughs> yeah. And how Your sister's you moving there? to... Oh, 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 I've been here about uh, eight years now, yeah. Oh, wow, that's lovely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and my sister, yeah, she... Well, she's just moved to Sweden now. Um, yeah, I think she moved maybe like a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, so it's a big change, but I think she's having a great time there. So <laughs> you moved to Sweden. Yeah. Huh? So what was the reason? Love or money or love, love. Yeah. Her, um, <laughs> her girlfriend is, uh, Swedish and she moved back, I think to be closer to her mum. And then mm. Coco was like, all right, I'll go there. But I think, I mean, we've been in London quite a long time, both of us, and it seems like um, the right time to sort of get out. You know, after a while, you're in like one city and sometimes you just want something different as well. So, But didn't you have like a global trotting tri- childhood? Did I read that right? Yeah, yeah, quite a global trotting childhood. Um, yeah, for like sort of half my childhood, I was living in a few places in Asia. Um, yeah, which was really nice. I miss it. I'm thinking of sort of, heading back there at some point it's just a it's a different kind of life there so yeah well you know travel broadens the mind and um they've got a great music scene in sweden so maybe she'll get you some gigs there and oh right yeah yeah she was showing me a few like swedish artists i can't remember um their sort of names and stuff but they they sound really nice i guess they've got i don't know it sounds like um quite sort of alternative kind of pop that's quite big there but i don't know if that's that's right but um yeah you get also compared to uh first aid kit quite a lot because they're like a, a sibling duo and that was the first band when i heard you i thought really yeah i mean i yeah people say that all the time but i haven't um i haven't listened to them that much <laughs> like, even, so i don't really know like i mean yeah i don't i've heard a few songs but um yeah i mean they sound good so mm. i'm glad that's what people hear but I mean sometimes people just I think even any two sisters people do tend to compare us it's also like they once people said that um you know they compared us to to them but I think they're very different like the style of music so I was like I don't know <laughs> to who that's uh, Tekken and Sarah they're called Ibei I think that's what their name is Ibei they're sort of two maybe like mixed sisters I'm not sure mm. um but I think they're a very different genre so I don't know if it's a fair comparison to <laughs> Um, but Tegan and Sarah, yeah, I used to listen to them when I was younger quite a bit. And you're Rilo um, Kylie as well. I hear that. I love them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have seen, that's like my favorite. So I got a bit obsessed for a very long time with Rilo Kylie. Because also your voices are just, they have this, um, uh, there's this, there's a real power to it. No, there's, and there's a real force. It's, you're, you're not like singing loud, but it's, it kind of carries through like a, like a, like a steady freight train. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think what helps is people say we have um, a very, me and my sister have a very um, similar voice sometimes. Okay. So often like two singers won't sing like in tandem, like f- um, throughout a song or something like that. But if we do, we, it kind of sounds like one voice sometimes that's very strong. 
I don't know. I, I, I think we sound completely different, but um, whenever we're doing gigs, sound guys will tell us things. And yeah, it's having twice the power. Yeah. 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 But she, she does some harmonies as well. Though. She goes hi sometimes and you go. So there is, you're not, you're not always doing the same voice, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, I love, I love doing harmonies. Um, so, I mean, it's quite a big part of it and she does really well with it sort of figuring out what what sounds nice and stuff like that but i just sort of yeah i've always loved um like i love the eagles or a lot of country music and stuff like that so it's it's harmonies for me are, um quite a important sort of aspect of music singing yeah because i'm actually quite new to harmonies i never used to do them but um so maybe you can give me some tips because is it like i was always worried that it should be like um you know, just a higher voice doing the same sort of melody, but is it, does it work better if, if you're doing like a counter melody, something completely different, or is that too confusing? I think, um, I think it, I, I mean, I guess it depends on the song. Um, but I think both work. I mean, the, the sort of doing it together kind of thing gets, I, I guess it gives a different kind of vibe. Um, a more, I don't know what, how to say it. Um, I'd say like songs where they have like the vocals sort of, yeah, basically the same together, like parallel. Um, they're more like a happy kind of vibe. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, it's more like expected, I would say. Like that's what people tend to do. I don't know. Whereas I think if you do, um, if you do vocals, yeah, sort of not in tandem and kind of overlapping and stuff like that, it's just, it gives it just different kind of texture and stuff. But they both work. It's just... Um, depending on what sort of sounds good and stuff like that. But we, we don't really have like a, I don't really have like a theory on it. We just sort of mess around with what works and sometimes argue about it. And then <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting because sometimes it, it's harder to do. If you come up with another a counter melody and someone's singing the, the straight melody and you've got to remember the counter melody, it's, it's like when someone else is singing another melody, it's quite difficult, yeah. right? It's, it's really difficult. I think I'm lucky because. Often I would sing sort of the main bit that we'd already figured out and uh, then Coax would have to sort of figure out um, another bit to do. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, <laughs> I'm always taking the easy route. Um, so yeah, she would sort of figure that out and she'd be sort of, you know, when she's figuring it out, like getting a bit annoyed if, if I'm sort of telling her what to do because she kind of not only has to figure out what works but also has to get used to me singing something different and then sort of adapting to that like yeah, that is yeah. yeah it's like doing I don't know two things at once like um like how I would be trying to play the piano so yeah but it does add a lot as, I, as I've listened more attentively as you do when you're studying something it's sometimes the, that that counter melody is really attractive and what draws you in and gives a song so much depth whereas if you were mm -hmm. both doing the same but you don't and they do these sometimes these these track by tracks where they play the parts of songs and and I've listened to watch those on YouTube and then you can yeah. hear you know the different voice different sounds in there that you you don't know are there but but really are the part of what make you like the song in the first place yeah that's sort of thing i guess when harmonies are done well i guess you have complementary sort of parts harmony parts and then you can have sort of diverging parts so you notice the bits that that sort of yeah diverge and stuff like that but you don't notice it when they're really complementing sometimes it will sound like one sort of sound mm -hmm. um but yeah it's really interesting i mean it's it harmonies are, are, are great i mean my mum comes from papua new guinea and um a lot of our family will sort of start singing a song uh, and they all will do different harmony parts and it's also quite natural it's like they all just sort of learn to <laughs> do that and start singing so i i always really like that singing aspect of music probably more than other aspects even though because i don't really know about a lot of the other parts so I can do the bass part. I can do like a deep, quite easy. And that's, but um, because in this collaboration, maybe we could do that. Maybe we could do some harmonies, and I could learn from you some, some of your techniques. And... Yeah. Well, that would be lovely because I've always, um, I've always wanted to sort of do some harmonies with with a sort of male voice. Um, it's quite different, I guess. With with we can't go as low with bits and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it would be really fun. I, I'm excited sort of how it all works as well. Yeah, fantastic. Um, doing the song together.
Yeah, well, that's, we've got a complete blank canvas now. I mean, you know, that's because there's, there's the music side of it and there's the the subject side of it. So we're gonna we'll we'll talk to Steve now and try and and get the lyrical content. But um, sometimes that the musical side for me just kind of comes, you know, afterwards, just because just as a secondary thing, you know, once you've got the subject, mm -hmm. things, things kind of fit together. You know, if it's if it's going to be a sad song and everything comes and and happy stuff but um i'm hoping you, in the interview because you uh, you studied anthropology biology and sociology yeah yeah well it was like biological anthropology and um social anthropology for my undergrad and then it was like psychological and psychiatric anthropology for my masters it sounds like more sounds very impressive it sounds better than it it actually was um but it, it we sort of dipped into a lot of aspects of things but i guess with the, with the subject you never became like a full expert on any particular thing i'd say and also I've, i think i've forgotten a lot of it i had a lot of tours and <laughs> hey uh, no let's have no my brain is now. <laughs> no, you've had enough time to research steve and i'm fully oh yeah i did research steve steve's stuff is really um isn't he great he's really uh he's really like the professor yeah. you would want a university you know it just makes that stuff it makes it all more interesting yeah yeah i'm very excited to sort of just hear his thoughts on everything really <laughs> but yeah I've got a few I wrote my questions down just so I can because I was scared like his stuff is so um it's very smart you know <laughs> and, it, and then it makes you a bit intimidated so <laughs> yeah but um I don't I don't think we need to have you know he I've heard him he can go he can go you know he's uh he doesn't need too much encouragement but um yeah yeah, I saw a few talks um, by him and, and yeah, yeah, it's very, uh, yeah, I think he, I mean, he has so many books as well. That's yeah. why I was looking at trying to research and then I was like, but w w which part? Because there's so many different mm. things that he's looked into. So, Well, this is our, yeah. um, this is our challenge as songwriters is, you know, it's a three minute song, four minutes, maybe if we're, mm -hmm. if we're being generous. So, you know, we could do the, tra the post-truth, the transhumanism or or something else you know or the red thread through it all yeah. you know yeah yeah i really like sort of um yeah the post truth stuff i didn't look as much into the transhumanism stuff but i mean obviously songwriting wise that's quite an interesting sort of thing to think about i don't know that but i think any any aspect of it would be quite fun and it's a nice sort of challenge i've never done anything like this um i've been sort of i've been working a lot more with with different uh musicians like people just sending me music and writing over it, just completely different genres and stuff like that because I like the challenge of just trying out something different but this is a sort of having a specific subject to write about it's, it's quite different for me but yeah I'm excited to try yeah no, it draws you out because you know you've got a, there's a it's really something to you know a blank piece of paper is is the hardest thing but if you have to if you have to write something to cover a specific subject it does it makes it more fulfilling None. But you were interested in intelligent design, and you you also said notions of academic freedom. So those are also yeah, yeah. I'm very. I mean, I guess they sort of. I've always been interested in like fringe things and conspiracies and things like that. And I guess I think that certain things like intelligent design have sort of been. Um, what does that? What does that? Like what ridiculous. does that mean, though? Let's just. What is intelligent oh, right. design? I guess it's like. Um, from what I gather, uh, it's the, um, like, instead of sort of, I guess they, they still believe in all the evolution stuff and things like that. They just think that, say, instead of saying it, I, I would say, like, in evolution, the main driving force of it is, is sort of chance or, or um, yeah, maybe chance or something like that. But, but, but intelligent designers think that there's a driving force of, of intelligence, basically. Okay, that, sure, yeah. That, um, yeah, so maybe it doesn't have to be a god. It could be. So it's not creationism. I don't know, something, or something similar. Or? I don't think so. I think it's very different. I think that there are a lot of people that are religious that like the idea of intelligent design, but they they definitely do look at it in a in a, in a scientific way. Mm -hmm. um, like certain things, like what is it? Well, one guy talked about like irreducible complexity. So there are certain things that you when you break them down um, into smaller and smaller 
like parts uh there's a point where you know like darwin said like you need small incremental steps in order to um have evolution and so some things it's like they're going from a to z or something you know it's like i think the eye is one there's like this bacterial flagellum i can't i looked at it this was years ago when i got really into it um but there's there's they, there's certain things where i would say there's a scientific aspect of it but it's a well actually steve would say it's not a sort of new thing like intelligent design was sort of the idea before with like i think natural philosophy and natural religion okay um but yeah i mean, it, I, I i don't know i'm not very good at sort of getting across my um thoughts that well um but yeah i don't know i got really into it um when we was i was studying uh evolutionary theory and i quite like just watching the debates between the people who were i pro id and sort of more traditional mm -hmm evolutionary scientists and it may it, it kind of watching them challenge this theory that's supposed to be sort of indisputable it was very nice to it taught me a lot so I, I think I learned more about evolution and some of the limitations of the theory um especially Dar, Dar, Darwinian Darwinian theory I learned a lot more by looking at those debates and I've always liked that the fringe debates that are even questioning the very sort of basic facts of something sometimes can can teach you a lot about the subject in the first place too yeah oh that's why we're here for to listen to smart people speak so i had uh lawrence krauss on he was quite really on that um darwinist so i'm more into the metaphysics as well i'm into the you know the devic presence and the and the the, oh, wow. the higher there are there are met, many hands at work behind the scenes so i'm with mm -hmm. you on that Okay, 100%. yeah, yeah. But Lawrence Krauss must have been, yeah, very interesting. I've watched uh, quite a few of his videos. I think I got into, um, what are they? they? He was one of the new atheists, I think, right. was at one point. Yeah. Um, so I was quite interested in these, like, God uh, debates, or is God real? And I think Lawrence Krauss was uh, sort of the universe came from nothing, I think. Yeah, that that's was right. His yeah. Book, something to do, yeah. Um, but yeah, I just, I guess I like debates. So yeah, yeah. I, like, I, I also like arguing with people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll not do it today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Rupert Sheldrake on as well. He's the more of the, the anti, mm. his antithesis, antithesis. So that was. Yeah. I think we learned a bit about him in anthropology, um, because of his sort of ideas about drugs and stuff like that. Um, I can't remember exactly, but I do like, I remember, I remember what, uh, Yeah listening a bit to Rupert Sheldrake as well when I was young. This was when I was um, a bit of a weed smoker, so <laughs> I, uh, some of it's a bit hazy, but I, I did uh, enjoy, so yeah, Rupert Sheldrake is very interesting. So it's, I never knew any of these people before. It's a, this whole project is a huge education oh. for me. So also Steve Fuller, it's like, you know, I was sorting out the cupboards today and had the, you have the headphones on, you listen to his other podcasts and, you know, just to, education every episode is fantastic it's uh it's brought yeah, how, my mind. how many have you done i'm um, up to um over 100 now yeah yeah and it, it's a great idea like thank you yeah i mean um it yeah it must be just really interesting i mean when i saw so you sent me that um list i guess of you know different people to possibly talk to they were just so many different like a range of people um with yeah with such with such different subjects and stuff like that so um it must be yeah incredibly interesting too and i guess you can share that with other people yeah as well, so. oh i've got so many people that want to come on I, don't, I haven't got enough time for them all so that's good to ask the musicians now who they would like to speak to because also there's when there's this connection you know that you're really mm -hmm. interested in this and you know you know a bit about it and you know it makes it a lot more a lot better interview and a lot better song because you know we really want to do a good job and also you've got the vocabulary so yeah you can cover for me because i really don't know anything <laughs> oh well um <laughs> i will i will try my best um mine's not I, I guess i i just find it difficult it's weird when you know when people get a bit um nervous about being on camera or something mm. and then they start acting weird Mine's like when I'm just talking about something, then I forget everything I, I know about anything. <laughs> so 
Well, I'll try my best, but um, yeah, it might go blank. But I'm sure Steve will uh, pick up the slack. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, but you've got a new respect for people when, you know, because we're used to being interviewed mm -hmm. yeah, as a musician, you know, you're just used to repeating the, the, the answers you've given a hundred times, you know, where did you grow up and what, you know, what are your influences and, but uh, to, to hold a thought, a train of thought, you know, and articulate it without saying, uh, you know, um, without, uh, you know, st stopping the flow. It's pretty difficult. Yeah. I really don't understand how, um, people do. I mean, anyone really like that is able to speak for, I mean, but sometimes it's for an, an hour, maybe longer. <laughs> someone's able to just speak, but I guess it's just, they, you know, they know what they're talking about like this is their subject that I remember at uni um you know the lecturers you'd ask them about a book or something like mm. that or uh, an aspect or something and then they would just sort of um, verbatim say a quote from a text that you're reading and it's like they just know that you know instinctively almost right, it's, right. A, it's very impressive I mean but it shows how much work's gone into it you know to be able to I guess do that um but I guess there are also other people that can just speak uh rubbish for an hour too so, <laughs> so that there's a way of uh um, you know falsifying that as well but i don't know yeah. well i think you know because he's written all these he's written these books as well so when you have to spend that much time you really have to think about what you think you know what your beliefs are and and, I, and articulate them once you've written the book so and then just to talk about an hour is you know to read the book takes 30 hours then you know he's he's got all this all this to pull on so i don't think we're gonna yeah. not really gonna strain him with our, yeah, with our yeah, insightful exactly. questions today <laughs> no i don't mean to. no but um yeah yeah just quite amazing um just how many books he has and stuff i mean like, mm. i've just pinpointed things that sort of i could um yeah i did you had to really like whittle it down because otherwise i mean we could probably talk to him for yeah hours of if we wanted that yeah mm. no just try and work out what what the song will be about and then you know what aspect and then ask him questions related to that as we as he get mm -hmm. you know maybe it's you know it's problem with him is too too interesting too many subjects yeah that can be yeah that can be an issue isn't it? when there's too much choice then it's hard to make any sounded decision yeah. um but i mean what things were you sort of drawn to was it the transhumanism stuff and 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 the truth stuff or um i don't know what it was there anything that you you thought was a particularly like song mm. like song worthy or something well what i'm interested to ask him about i don't know if that's going to be the song but um because actually with this podcast it's kind of a spiritual podcast is i've stopped studying metaphysics mm -hmm. and um you know the um, I remember the Ethereum Society in Fulham. They're based in Fulham, right. and it's a uh, it's kind of a it's a yogic religion that incorporates UFOs that we evolve into to live on other planets, you know, different frequencies of vibration. Mm -hmm. So that's when you raise Kundalini, you can leave this this classroom. So I wanted to ask him about because he's saying to advance, you know, and to do all the things that we want as humans. We need to improve the phys the material, the physical matter. But uh, from what I've been taught from the metaphysics, the way to improve that is through mantra, pranayama and prayer and selfless service to others. And that we already have superpowers. We just haven't, we just kind of denied our psychic powers because we've involved ourselves through free, free and indulging our free will. Mm -hmm. Um, and so adding an implant here or, or lengthening the lifespan, trying to do it externally, or as the, um, ionosphere comes down, trying to do all things artificially, you know, it's really, we have enough power with Kundalini to, to be Superman. So we're kind of looking outside for solutions when really we have, we have the full toolkit if we just, if we only right. do it. Yeah. And I mean, I do, do you think that even, I guess like focusing so much on the material aspect of things could actually limit those, um, spiritual aspects of yourself yeah. as well? Yeah, exactly. So you're, you're marching in the wrong direction. So, I mean, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm kind of torn more so because, you know, we're here in a classroom, we're here to advance. So the technology aspect is these lessons are being put in front of us because, 
life on the other planets is very technologically advanced, you know, um, if you look at the speed of the UFOs and the, you know, the things they can do just as, a, as, as an example, you know, it's, mm -hmm. we're here to advance, but to do it in a spiritual way. So, which is pretty difficult. I don't think anyone's really doing that because they seem to be in our, in our modern society, there's, you're either one or the other. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do think we've lost quite a bit of that spirituality. Even in, in where my mum's from in Papua New Guinea, um, it, they still have a lot of, you know, spiritual sort of ideas and, and that, I guess that sort of, um, I mean, I guess their sort of beliefs as sort of ancestors and ghosts and things like that, but it, it, it's very much like alive there. Whereas when I came to, um, yeah, well in England, uh, people have a sort of often quite a, um, yeah, materialistic view of the view of the world, um, and sort of biologically deterministic in a way. Mm, mm. Um, that I guess I, I'm a bit, I can be half, half with things like I have, I'm, I've always been quite interested in like spiritual ideas and, and looking, I'm an agnostic. So I'm, I'm sort of, I kind of, I, I'm interested in all the different aspects because I'm like, I don't know what, what is, uh, you know, the truth and stuff like that. But I, I, I'd quite like to know as much as I can about all the different, um, versions of it that people have that they think are true. So I don't know. Yeah. I mean, the Ethereum society is, uh, it's kind of, it's the religion for the Aquarian age, it's the future religion. So it is very technological. It's very UFOs that have, you take spiritual energy, you put it in a battery of crystals, and then you can release it when there's a crisis or put it into a psychic center of the earth or do things with it. So in that sense, it is, I tried, but it's in my, when, when you, I tend to reject the technological things in as a, as an instant reaction, because I have you know, if you want to be a kind of in that spiritual sense, you think of the, you know, the American Indians and, and, you mm -hmm. know, the people in nature and those people do reject to tell us that technology is, is the wrong way to go. So my ideas are evolving all the time as everyone sh should be. Yeah. And do you think, I guess, cause I've looked into things or heard things before about, um, people in the past sort of harnessing that kind of energy. Um, do you think that sort of that was the way people were doing it before, like the spiritual energy to power things or do that kind of sure. thing. Sure. Well, there was Atlantis, you know, a million years ago and then Lemurius before that. And then, um, Maldek, another planet, but, uh, and through, through probing the atom, we, uh, destroyed those civilizations. So yeah, I do think, uh, the science is science without God is the soulless wanderer of the night. So. You know, we, just because we're very involved at the moment and we're in a very atheist society and that's the way we've, as a reaction, this is great thing about speaking to Steve because he's, you know, you can, he can tell you when religion did the split and this, he can, that this, mm -hmm. this, this reign of thought is a reaction against that. And then probably what will come next is a reaction to the current thought trains. Cause you know, that's the beauty of studying history and philosophy is like, um, so it'd be great to chat to him about this stuff and, and find out his, his insights as to, as to this reactionary mm -hmm. thought patterns that we're, we're going through. And yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what I, I really liked about all the post truth stuff. I think, um, but I do, I definitely, I don't know, since sort of my studies and, and I've changed a lot. Um, and I just, I find it a bit troubling when people are too, I guess like the scientism sort of stuff when, when people. Scientism. Too, yeah. I like that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah it's it feels like that it's sort of like this this kind of it's a religious belief in it feels like that in science which i, th I think is worrying especially when there's so much sort of making fun of religion mm. and and stuff like that from a lot of people that i've met and and you know like yes yeah, steve sort of said about um <laughs> there being this this relationship <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's the man himself who talking mm -hmm. about him and he's arrived remember those questions though holly Yes, yes. I've got some written down. I'm ready. <laughs> Hello, Steve. Hi. Uh, Hi there. Can you can I I could see you? Uh both of you? That's great. And you could see me? Yeah. yeah. Good. You're in a mm -hmm. is that your reading material for today behind you? <laughs> no, no, it's my object this is my office, how it normally looks. Um 
Yeah, I figure this is the best place to record. The The sound quality from my end is likely to be best here. The weight of intellectual thought is behind you. Well, I didn't mean to. I oh, didn't mean no, to. It's well, impressive. <laughs> no, no. Actually, my home will have some, would have some books too, but not so much. <laughs> so I'm in uh, Italy. Holly's in London. Um, mm -hmm. And so Holly, Holly's the guest musician. She's going to sing the song. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Good. Good luck. I. I. I I'll tell you. <laughs> God knows what's going to happen, but uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to this very much. I. I, <laughs> I used to be a disc jockey, by the way. Oh, really? Oh, a long time ago when I was in college. Uh, and and um, yeah, actually, uh, I didn't have to didn't have to have that many skills because it was during the period of progressive rock. So you just put the you know the one side of the album on for. 15 minutes and it just plays itself basically <laughs> right so we're talking you know pink floyd yes you know the jethro tell those kinds of guys led zeppelin is that the genre we have to do for the song or are you are you open mind no 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 i'm not suggest no no in fact I'm, I'm a guy who moves with the times and in, in fact i listen to all kinds of popular music uh uh in, in fact when i'm working i usually listen to dance music oh okay yeah do you have a preference of what we uh this is how we go with the song. Oh, oh, well, I'm. <laughs> you want to dance tonight? <laughs> that's that's interesting. I, I mean, well, you're in London, right? So I listen to to uh, Radio One, uh, and and so I'm interested. You know, so I like Pete Tongue and people like that. Um, you know, so uh, but but also, uh, you know, if you you pick other eras as well. Um, no, in fact, I I have quite a you know sort of a wide range of music sort of on rotation while I'm working because I usually have earphones on when I'm working. And so I listen to lots of different stuff. Um, I'm just trying to think of something, uh, some stuff I've been listening to lately. Uh, well, I listen to Depeche Mode a lot, um, you know, um, just trying to, because I actually listen to a lot of contemporary stuff as well. And, you know, some of that stuff just sort of comes and goes, uh, you know, but every now and then I dip into stuff that has a little more, uh, a little more longevity to it. Um, but no, I, I, I'm quite open, but, um, you know, right. um, Muse. Okay. So I've been listening to Muse. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's Difficult to make that. Oh. The, yeah. No, I'm not, I'm not saying you have to, I, no, I didn't realize you were going to ask no, me, no. right? But, you know, I mean, you know, Knights of Sidonia or something. <laughs> Jeez. Um, what up? <laughs> no, you didn't realize what you got yourself into no, here. No. <laughs> You you decide this. You okay. thought this was just going to be. You thought this was just going to be folk music or something. <laughs> no, we're, we're, we'll decide the genre. Let's just stick to the subject now. Okay, Let's just okay. do subject. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so before, just to follow in because we were we've been chatting for half an hour now, getting into the groove. You know what we're going to chat about, and you know it's it's a, it's a big canvas. So, what we were just discussing just as you came on was. Um, this like kind of longevity and also the um, the because there's this transhumanism that's just what i'm saying there is the people who want to extend the mind and people who want to extend the body um that's right and that's right so we were talking about life and death and learning lessons and i heard you say on another show that there's this rigidity and i've noticed it myself in the the people stop learning after a certain age. And so if they extend their lives, really, yeah. and you use the example of science that I've heard said that that's right. science advances one funeral at a time. Yes, basically, that's right. Yes. No, that's exactly, that's exactly right. Yes, that there needs to be intergenerational change. And there's no incentive for intergeneral, intergenerational change if people are going to be living forever. And that's one reason why people who are transhumanists tend not to have children to begin with. Huh? Because all the things that they would expect their children to be able to do, right? They figure they can do themselves because they'll have enough time to do it in, right? So they're sort of imagining they'll be kind of rolling through many different careers over the course of a, a lifespan that lasts several centuries, mm -hmm. right? Whereas in the past, right, you would say, you know, you can only do a certain amount. You sort of already accept that as given, but then you imagine that your children in a way can fulfill some of your dreams. Right. And so, so much of the discussion, in fact, about the relationship between parents and children has this kind of projective quality to it. Right. That disappears under transhumanism, it seems to me. At least the incentive for that way of thinking about why you would have children uh, goes away. 
Uh, and in fact, it's not clear why you would have children under, uh, you know, under the circumstances if you're a transhumanist. I mean, from a society standpoint, there's a great reason to have children. And it's precisely what you put your finger on, namely that if we want a change in ideas, if we want a change in perspectives, that it becomes necessary periodically to bring in people who start from scratch, basically, right? Which is the new generation. You know, so it makes a big difference, for example, that let's say I was alive and I saw on TV first man on the moon in 1969. I was only 10 years old. I saw it. It makes a big difference, though, whether you're reading about it in a history book or even watching it in a video now. Right. Uh, and that difference is important. And it's not necessarily to the advantage of the person who sees it the first time around, because the people who see it later and have some distance from it are perhaps able to frame it, perhaps have a less nostalgic view, nostalgic view of it. You know, I mean, there, there are all kinds of shifts that take place intellectually, you know, simply by having distance and that kind of idea of distance. And keep in mind, by the way, transhumanists are the kind of people, if you look at the kinds of diseases that they tend to want to cure of the mind, Alzheimer's, they want people with perfect memories. And you see, that's bad too. I don't know if you remember that film with Jim Carrey uh, from, from early in the 2000s, right? Um, the Spotless Mind. Oh, yeah. Right, right, that movie. Right, right. That's, that's an important movie here, okay, for, from the standpoint of what the problems of transhumanism is, that there is something to be said from, as it were, not remembering, right? And if you come from the next generation, you don't remember because you never had the experience to begin with. And so that's why, you know, so if you look at intellectual change, scientific change, the generational shift has to do with the fact that the young generation is not as invested in the old ways of doing things as the old people are. And if you want to explain, for example, the resistance to Darwin, the resistance to Einstein, right? It's a generational difference. It's not that these people couldn't understand the ideas. It's not that the old guys couldn't understand the ideas. They could understand them all too well. What they could also understand was that if these ideas took hold, it would make what they've been doing for the past 30, 40 years obsolete, right? So they have no incentive to accept them. But if you're a young person who goes into the world and you see that the people who are dominant, right, are holding these old views, then the only way you're going to make headway is going to be by, in some way, opposing them. And so you have an incentive to take up the new views, especially if the new views kind of make sense, right? I mean, I mean, and, and so this is kind of, transhumanism really has a problem with this. How are you going to get this kind of periodic opportunity for intellectual change if you don't have new blood cycling through the system? Yeah, you suggested temp, uh, periodic memory resets, but... Um, it... Yeah, or you could just kill people, yeah. right? I mean, you could, you know, no, and, 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 I, and I do think, you know, as you, as you may have seen, right, that, that the, um, the death... Right. For me, the issue of death becomes a really important moral issue in transhumanism, right? Because so much of what the meaning of life has been, right, in terms of the way we think about it, certainly in the Western tradition, has been to do with the finitude of life, right? That the meaning of life is something, you know, you've got a limited amount of time. What are you doing with it? But if you've got an unlimited amount of time, then you never have to kind of prioritize. You could just like do things one thing after another, this kind of business. Right. So there's no sense of need for focus or anything like that. Um, and so the issue of meaning in life begins to kind of fade or becomes very ambiguous under transhumanism. And what that means then is that death also then starts to shift. Uh, because one of the reasons why there's been taboos on things like suicide and euthanasia or even killing people for that matter uh, is because life is already being seen as precious and finite to begin with. But if life is something that is indefinite in its longevity and could be revived, let's say, right? Be, you know, you could be regenerated or resurrected or something like that. Um, then death, it seems to me, becomes more of a, a straightforwardly moral issue about making room for others, right? And becomes a much more elective notion and where there might end up being a kind of ethic that says you've got to know when your time is up that that is part of what self-discipline is. And this was, of course, the classical view of defending suicide, right, back in the Stoics. If you go back to the Ro Roman Stoics, for example, right, and, and, and actually some, of, some modern uh, people who defend suicide typically do it on that kind of ground, that uh, there is no intrinsic value in just hanging around, um, and, and that part of being a rational self-governing being 
is that you know when to check out. Uh, and and, um, and so this, uh, you know, it seems to me that this becomes, I think, a much more important issue under uh, transhumanism, that this becomes much more of a direct moral kind of issue. Um, and, and then euthanasia and all these other sort of death-oriented things, right, then acquire a certain kind of moral force, where, as it were, the burden of proof is on you then, from a moral standpoint, to carry on. Because, of course, you can carry on, but why do it? given the liabilities that are involved with regard to bringing in new stuff. Sorry. I'd... Well, let me ask this one question before Holly takes over with her, uh, her long list, is that what happens if the system is already perfect? Because you're, you're, you're saying what, what makes us human, basically, memory, personality, or physicality, what, what should we preserve? And if we live in a reincarnatory cycle where we, lo where yeah. we lose the physicality, um, and the memory is wiped every time because if we were reborn with full memory, that would be a disaster. We'd we go around, exactly. we'd go around kissing old people. We'd 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 want our property back. We we'd have all these hang-ups. We wouldn't develop. So this system of yeah, think about cryonics. Think about the nightmare of cryonics if it works, <laughs> right? This is what you're pointing yeah, to. But what happens if if we it it what happens the what I'm saying is the system is already perfect because when we die re, we reincarnate. So why, if the whole idea of transhumanism is, is anti-nature because it's actually better to keep going. <laughs> See, I don't, I don't, I mean, I'm not a nature fetishist about this. I, I don't think nature is kind of the issue. I think it actually is more about the humanity issue. Okay. Uh, and I do think that the finitude, right, the finitude of the human is a, is a kind of important defining feature of what it is to be human, right? I mean, it's, again, I don't think it's accidental that the meaning of, you know, that all the philosophers who think about the meaning of life talk about, you know, what, what, you know, Kierkegaard and Heidegger called the being unto death, right? Where there's a sense in which you confront the limit, right? And then the issue, and, and so, um, and, and I think this is kind of, and, it, and so in, it, in this regard, okay, um, uh, I'm, I'm coming at it, um, you might say, my, my notion of the human is kind of a theologically informed notion, which is about human exceptionalism. So in other words, what is it that, you know, so, so humans in a way are kind of like the imperfect gods, right? And the imperfection comes in the finitude, right? And if you don't have the finitude, then it's not clear, let's put it this way, that we're prepared to be God, right? I mean, so in other words, what, when you take the limits off, what do we have left? What, where do we do exactly, right? And I think that the transhumanists, you know, when they, when they sort of, met, the, the transhumanists have this kind of, um, I don't know. It's, it's, it's almost like they don't quite get what it's been to be human um, because they, they sort of just think you just sort of carry on. Right. But, 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 but it is, but, but, but there's a sense in which the limit notion is built in. It's built into so many aspects of what it is to be a human being, whether we're talking about, you know, the possibility for change, right. If, if, if we're talking about how you get meaning in life, right. Right. Finitude is built into that. And I think this then really, it raises some very profound questions about the way in, see, because transhumanism advertises itself as, as it were, taking human to the next level, right? So in other words, it's not trying to get rid of the human, it's trying to amplify the human, right? That's the official goal of transhumanism, right? But I'm saying that if you don't take this limit idea seriously, even as you're extending life and all the rest of it, you're going to lose the human in the process, right? So it's really that it's the limit notion um, that that's the important thing, um, and 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 you know where does this come from? I, I, as I say, I think you know, and I say this in the in 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 my works. Again, this is this is not a view that all transhumanists share, but I actually think it's it's a theological idea. Namely, it's not that we are in some way. It's not like we are the superior animal, but rather we're fallen gods. Okay. Uh, and, and, and in some sense, we're trying to rectify that status, right? Cause transhumanism comes from a place of lacking, right? I don't live enough, right? It's not about wanting to be better than the other animals, right? It's rather missing something, right? There's a kind of inadequacy, right? right? Transhumanism is built in with a, into, with a permanent sense of inadequacy. And that's why if you actually allow, right, all of this enhancement stuff, there's really no natural, there is no natural limit to that stuff. That stuff just goes on indefinitely. But where does it lead you? Wow. You see? Yeah, so, so it's, it's that kind of thing. It comes from a state of inadequacy. And that's kind of, 
you know, in theological terms, that's what original sin is supposed to be, where you feel like you're lacking God. Mm. You're deprived, right, of the meaning, huh. the source of your being, right? This kind of thing. That's where it comes from. It doesn't come from wanting to be a superior animal. Because if you wanted to be a superior animal, you'd, you, you'd, you'd respect the planet more, frankly, right? It's the transhumanist impulse that's got us to this kind of, you know, precipice of the climate crisis and all the rest of it where we're, we're sort of eliminating species and willy nilly, you know, and, and, and all the rest. I mean, um, if we were, if we really, you know, if we really identified so strongly with being animals, we wouldn't have gotten ourselves to this state. We've got so deep so quickly. I, I just, I'm sorry. I just think, <laughs> I'm not, I'm, there's bub bubbles forming in my veins. <laughs> Whoa. Sorry it's about that. I mean, I know it's we're only fifteen minutes in. I mean, <laughs> great material. Yeah, yeah, no, it's great. Um, <laughs> Are you know, recording this? Yeah. Oh yes, every moment. Okay, recording. Recording. Yeah. Good, good, good. <laughs> you might say, "What? What did that guy say?" Ah, oh, nah, no, he didn't say that, <laughs> did he? <laughs> I guess I've always thought that. Um, I guess that sort of imperfectness um, was the the main thing about being human like sort of that buddhist idea of like you know the suffering is the the thing that is the point of life makes us learn and stuff like that so i'm yes yeah, I'm, I'm worried about that but also i guess when you were talking about um like the young generations and and older generations in science and and how that kind of uh that relationship helps progress sort of ideas and stuff if you had this transhuman society where everyone lives forever i mean do you have then any kind of progress because no <laughs> no the answer is no and and in fact if you look at the science fiction stories right where you do have these characters who live on planets who live forever right it's like a world of elders right it, it's like it becomes this kind of suspended animation thing basically right all the science fiction stories that really take this idea of of indefinite longevity end up like that. And that's exactly what happens. I mean, I mean, I'm amazed people find this so attractive, but you do actually, you know, when people like Aubrey de Grey, you may know Aub Aubrey de Grey, who's a guy who believes that, you know, we can, uh, we, 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 we can sort of reverse the aging process, uh, by re-engineering our cells and stuff like that. So they don't deteriorate over time as they're reproducing. Um, and, and, um, he actually likes that idea. He likes that idea of a, a, a world of permanent elders and stuff like this. And, 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 you know, I, I'm saying, what? No, no, there is no progress. It's, it, you get stasis, right? Right. You get the, you get the illusion that you've reached heaven because nothing's changing anymore. Right. I mean, this is the thing. It becomes a kind of optical illusion because you don't see change. You think things are, are great. Is it born from fear? Well, I mean, obviously these cl characters are afraid of death and it's not by accident that the sort of people who are attracted to transhumanism are kind of people in my age group, right? So-called middle youth, right? Who kind of feel very live and healthy, but, but, you know, feel that in some sense the clock is ticking, right? Uh, and, 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 you know, they, they, they want to carry on, right? And they want to carry on being as they have been. And they figure, you know, it just takes a couple of tweaks of the genome and stuff like that and boom we'll be around for you know thousands of years but some people are as frightened of the opposite i, I think that's a, i mean i think that's a, that's not a trivial point by the way about the about the people who are attracted to this kind of stuff it, it does represent a certain kind of age group and male primarily male uh and and you know i would say kind of like you know the 40 to 70 so the salvageable group right so another you can't if you're 80 or 90 you know you know it's pretty you know that would be a miracle in terms of the regenerative possibilities but if you've got these predictions that all these people make, these transhumanists make, that we're going to be able to reverse aging, let's say within 20 years, then everybody's thinking, mm, well, I might have a chance. I might have a chance. I might be in with a chance with that, right? So the time frame, the predictions, right? Because there's always a lot of predictions that then motivates the investment of money into this kind of research. And you've got to look at the time frames. They're always, they're never more than a generation away because if it's more than a generation away, the people funding it won't be able to benefit from it. And how do these guys feel about you running around with a mirror, <laughs> holding this mirror up to their face? And, you know. Well, I mean, it's, it, it varies because first of all, I think the one thing they will say, I take them seriously, okay? I mean, because there is a whole 
you know, I, I would say, you know, certainly within the academic community, um, most people think transhumanism is science fiction. Okay. Uh, and they don't, and, 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 and I think a lot has to do with the fact that, um, they kind of focus, academics tend to focus very much on the kinds of explicit empirical predictions that these people make, which is probably the most far-fetched thing about them, right? When they say, oh, by the year 2030 or 2040, you know, shortly before we're supposed to become carbon neutral, we'll be able to live forever. Just right? I mean, this is kind of, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. You, so you got to put these things in balance, right? I mean, people are saying all kinds of crazy things at the moment, but, but, but the point is this is part of the, the time frame, right? And, and so, you know, I think it's reasonable for academic people, especially ones who actually work on the research frontiers of, you know, neuroscience and various other biosciences to be skeptical, right? That these, that these predictions are going to come about, especially since I, I would say that most of the research being done related to this stuff tends to be in the private sector or maybe in China or someplace like that, but it isn't really part of the mainstream agenda of academic scientific research. Okay. Now, this is not to deny that there is a lot of private money supporting this, right? So, so, you know, don't get me wrong. Uh, but, but I think the fact is the fact that the public sector is not supporting this very strongly, um, uh, you know, leads to skepticism. And, 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 but I put all that to one side because I don't think the time frame issue matters so much. It matters to the people who put the money in, but I don't think it matters so much intellectually because I do think that there is a sense in which our general trajectory in the modern era having to do with the way in which science and technology has come to kind of move our future and move our self-understanding as human beings means that we're heading there. It might not happen as fast as everyone thinks, right? Uh, but it is going to happen. So in other words, I do think it is not early to think about the moral consequences of it. And you see, this is why I take all this stuff about, you know, intergenerational change and death and all of that very seriously, because I think we need to have some thought out views about these matters, right? Um, and, and, and it'll take a generation or two to get our heads around this stuff because we still have taboos around death to begin with. Um, so we're going to need to have some kind of, because I do think we're going to have to be um, more positive about death. Basically, we're going to have to, you know, people will, you know, suicide will be a kind of social responsibility, um, you know, uh, and, but that's going to take a while to get, get on board. Um, I mean, I don't know if you guys, a parenthetical thing, because you guys are young, you don't remember maybe, but back in the 1970s, uh, there was this movie starring Charlton Heston called Soylent Green. I don't know if you've ever heard of this film. I've heard of it, yeah, but I haven't watched it. Okay, well, the thing about this film, it's related to this issue, but it's coming at it from the standpoint of overpopulation, which was kind of the way in which um, the the global ecological catastrophe was first expressed when, when ecological consciousness became a, a kind of global political issue which in the early 1970s, uh, it was about overpopulation, depleting resources, right? This kind of thing. That was the way it was put. And so you're supposed to imagine an earth that by the year, I don't know, 2000 or something. So this film's coming out in the early seventies, um, you know, 22 billion or something. Uh, and, and, and so, um, one of the things that happens in this society, so just to give you the punchline of the film, Soylent Green is human beings that get turned into soy chips, basically. Uh, and that becomes the staple food of the society. So there's this kind of recycling going on, basically. It's very green. It's very <laughs> green. Um, but the point, the, but the interesting thing from the standpoint of the transhumanist stuff is that in this society, um, people are highly incentivized to commit suicide, okay, uh, as a way of, you know, lessening the population load. And one of the incentives that they provide and this goes to the issue um, that's kind of on our horizon now, is that um, the government uh, does a kind of big kind of multimedia film extravaganza of your life, which you then get to watch as you are taking the suicide serum. Uh, and so you're lying right on this hospital bed type thing, and the film is shown on the ceiling, and you're getting ejected, and you see this thing passing through and by the time it's over you're gonna have this in switzerland already no <laughs> well maybe they did but 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 the, the the reason why the reason why i bring this point up okay is because uh, one of the things it's one of the things i talk about it in in that nietzschean meditations book 
is the uh, digital afterlife. The idea of the digital afterlife, okay? So the digital afterlife is kind of our way of moving in that direction. Because what it does is it incentivizes people, people who are on social media and who have all kinds of photos and videos and audios and texts and stuff, you know, Facebook everywhere. And, and, it, and, and it kind of encourages them to archive this stuff, right? And then they can provide this stuff to a company which basically develops an algorithm right which is able to mix and match this stuff right to basically create holograms of you right so so you get novel combinations right because people archive an enormous amount of stuff these days right i mean they spend a lot of their they, they spend almost as much time archiving as they do making stuff right on social media and so you actually have a very rich data source on which an algorithm can operate to create versions of you in cyberspace right that carry on forever Right. Uh, and can interact with people and maybe, you know, if the algorithms are, you know, they can be self-programming, they can actually learn. So your digital afterlife can actually evolve over time in a new self and all that. And this stuff, by the way, is marketed to loved ones of the deceased. Okay. So you're the kid or, or wife or husband or whatever of the person who dies. Right. They've been archived in this wonderful way. They've got the algorithm running through them. Right. And boom, they'll pop up on your smartphone whenever you need them. Or maybe even when you don't need them, they'll just pop up arbitrarily. Right. And, and you can have conversation with them and they'll respond in the characteristic way and you'll respond. And, and they may actually pick up some things from you along the way and learn and all the rest of it. And they'll, they'll be with you forever. And they'll be, and they could be anywhere. They could be maybe roaming around cyberspace, picking up some nasty habits along the way. By the way, that's the interesting thing about the digital afterlife is that the, um, the people who tend to like it are the people who archive it. So the, the people who will be in the afterlife, they tend to like it. The people who are much more iffy about it are the potential recipients, the loved ones, because the loved ones are very worried that if these things, as it were, have a very powerful algorithm you know, attached to, which allows for self-programming and learning, right? So these, these digital avatars can actually develop, can actually evolve in cyberspace through interaction, not only with the loved ones, but just roaming around, right? Sucking up data everywhere. And, you know, like these avatars often do, uh, and you know, they pick up some nasty habits perhaps. And one day they show up, you know, uh, you know, in the loved ones, uh, inbox and there they are, and they're suddenly transformed. Right. They've suddenly picked up something. Right. And they're no longer the person who was their father or mother or whatever, but they've evolved. Right. They, they, they have the second life. Um, and, and you see, uh, this is what, but, and, and, and I'll tell you just, just, you know, the Vatican is very concerned about this. Um, you know, uh, because you know, this issue of afterlife and so forth. And because the thing is that, that, uh, these companies actually are, are, proliferating, they're expanding, um, and, and people are getting more interested in doing this. So even long before people, cause in the beginning, this was basically the kind of thing that, that you, you, you sort of figured out when you realized your days were numbered, right? So if you had cancer or something like this, and you know, you're going to, you know, die within a year or two that then, then you start, you know, to organize yourself just like you would, you know, like, you know, what people do when they know they're going to die, right. They, they organize their, uh, that they have a, a will, right? That they, they kind of organize themselves so that they can deliver themselves as a legacy <laughs> to the next generation. But, but yeah, well, that's kind of what happens in, in real life. Um, and, and, but the thing is now as this business kind of, you know, uh, kind of expands and as people, you know, are much more on social media as part of their regular lives, right? This activity starts much earlier, right? And, and this is what the Catholic church in particular is worried about. Because it looks like, as it were, people start living for this, living right. for what their digital afterlife will be, and they will undervalue the life they're actually leading. Now, you see, this is an interesting, I, this, interesting development because this is happening now. Okay. So this is happening now and you have to think, okay, what kind of an impact does this kind of mentality end up having on issues about what it means to live forever? Right. Cause I think this ends up actually not only befuddling the Catholic church, but it also befuddles a lot of transhumanists who are very concerned about staying in the physical body. Right. Cause as you were pointing out, uh, 
uh, uh, Jim, uh, the, 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 you know, that there are two kinds of transhumanists. Some want to keep the mind ar- around forever. Others want to keep the body around. Well, the ones who, who want to keep the mind around probably don't mind this too much. They like this kind of digital afterlife thing. They want to keep the mind around, right? But the people who are interested in keeping the body around, who, who are very much about, you know, me living in my youthful body forever, you know, as it exists, right? The, the digital afterlife stuff undermines that kind of thing. Because it, it offers the potential that if you're in a, in, a, in a kind of digital form, you, you know, depending, you know, if you get a, a premium algorithm, you might actually be able to be able to reconfigure yourself in all kinds of interesting ways. And people may come to remember you quite differently from what they, how they would remember you if you were just in your, you know, dead biological form. It's going to be a movie about this sometime, isn't there? It's gonna, <laughs> this is the next one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but the thing is, but this is happening now. So it's a point that, because given that, that, that we are so many, you know, we're a few decades away from actually being able to live forever in some literal biological sense, this is happening now. And I'm saying that this actually ends up conditioning, right? How people, what people's attitudes are toward their minds, their bodies. You're on the, you're on the general, smartphone scrolling. So what are you doing? You're wasting time. No, I'm working on my legacy. Well, yes. Well, yes. And, and, and so there's a more, there's an ethics of that, right? And the Catholic church thinks that that's kind of irresponsible. It, you know, it's kind of like narcissism or something, you know, it's kind of how they interpret it. Um, but, 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 you know, th- this goes to the question of how do you define the meaning of life? Right. I mean, and, 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 and so this is, see, this is, this, this really ends up querying the pitch with regard to the transhumanist issue. Cause I don't think transhumanists because transhumanists generally have two kinds of views of, of what longevity looks like. One of them is this idea you stay in your biological body forever without deteriorating. And the other one is kind of what I think you were alluding to earlier, Jack, was this uh, business of, um, of, of uploading, right? Uploading the mind into a machine. And in a way, the digital afterlife stuff is a bit like that, but not quite, right? Not quite, because we're talking about, you know, uploading your pictures, your, you know, videos. Right. So it has a little bit of the body aspect in a way in it. Right. So when you're interfacing with digital dad, right. When, when, you know, uh, after dad dies and you're interfacing with digital dad, there he is. Right. You, you see him. He's not some, you know, mental force, you know, from the cosmos. <laughs> These questions keep coming back, you know, like meaning of life and the legacy and, and what makes you an individual, your memory, your personality, your physicality. It's all, it's your, all your ideas. You're te- you're just run- you're targeting these things from different angles, you know, as as society develops and as yeah. these new inventions, or new products, well, the products basically yeah, come along to tag to target these fundamental human fears or needs. Yes, yeah. that's right. No, that's right. Um, and 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 it is it is interesting because I think, um, in a way, um. Well, I mean, you know, with a lot of this stuff that turns out to be really innovative, you never quite know just kind of what kind of market you've got until you get it, you know? Because, well, <laughs> you're, I mean, because you studied history uh, and philosophy. So you, you see, before technology sure, sure. came along, people were probably doing these same things with maybe shrines or, or rituals. Yeah, sure, sure. No, no. I mean, I, I think, I think the key thing here is, um, Historically, and, and this is where the digital stuff, in a way, raises these matters again. Um, historically, oh, I'm gone. Oh, I'm back again. Sorry, I was gone for a moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah you can hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, I mean, when people were talking about having a legacy in the past, like with the shrines and all the rest of it, okay, um, legacy was a notion that was quite clearly collective-oriented. Okay, right. So it's a legacy for a community, right? The shrine only makes sense right. for the people it's covered who come in to it. Ivy and overgrown and falling down. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, um, I I think the interesting thing uh, is uh, if we're talking about individuals, legacy is individuals, and you see, um, in a way, the uh, the 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 digital uh, the digital afterlife stuff is kind of marketed as a kind of individual legacy, okay? But my point would be that uh, if these things are really well-programmed, 
and the and the and the digital avatars are migrating around in cyberspace, they're going to pick up lots of stuff. Digi digital bank account, you know, and and this is why the. Well, yeah, they could do that too, right? They could no. I mean, by the way, there's a whole legal side to this that's very difficult, right? Because what you know, uh, you know, who's responsible if digital dad turns out, you know, to to be, you know, taking money, you know, from from the treasury. <laughs> Because he, he he acquires a couple of skills along the way that enables him to be a hacker, you know, and then he channels it into Bitcoin. I mean, you know, I mean, what a nightmare, right? Who's responsible for that? Are the kids responsible for that? Right? Are the kids responsible? I mean, especially if the kids, if the kids were the ones that had subsets partially funded this guy coming into existence? Possibly. I think... Well, no, I mean, it's a legal, no, it's a serious it's legal issue. No, no, there's no, there's no straightforward answers at, at the moment to this. But the point is the issue you raise, right, about the, the nature of the transformation. This is why the, this is why the loved ones uh, tend to want these algorithms that are used to uh, process all of this data uh, to be relatively simple, not to be able to allow self-programming that could allow digital dad to roam effortlessly through cyberspace and pick up new friends and new skills and all the rest of it. Um, right. But the, but the people who, who, but the digital dads actually like the idea. They like the idea of expanding their horizons after they're gone. You see, in that case, then what happens to your individuality under those circumstances? Right. Because if the, because when the kids want to remember you, they want to remember you as a very particular kind of person, right. Of the person who raised them, whatever. Right. But when digital dad, you know, digital dad has a, a, an afterlife that's longer than his real life. Okay. I mean, I, I mean, you know, what does digital dad look like after year 200? You know, I mean, um, does he any longer still belong to the kids or the grandkids for that matter? You know, uh, I mean, this is the thing. This is the thing. I mean, so, uh, I, I you know, these things haven't been worked out though, of course, because we're still in relatively early stages. And, and again, it's another one of these things where, um, you know, oh, it's only bodies like the Catholic church, which always have their moral antennae out, right. Um, that really pick up on this, that this in fact is a quite a significant sea change with regard to how people regard the limits of themselves, you know, the limits of their person. Good old Catholic church. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. I mean, is when, um, I guess like digital dad, is he <laughs> experiencing like the person that dies, the dad that dies, is he experiencing life as digital dad or is that a separate being that's sort of, cause I don't see the fun in living on it. If I'm not the one experiencing it, I don't really, uh, yeah. And also I think it's quite unhealthy, the, um, sort of not being able to let go or have loss. So that sort of uh, the the comfort for the family members seems sort of an unhealthy relationship, like attachment to I don't know. Well, look, um, let's put it this way. I mean, this is why the Catholic Church gets interested in stuff like this. Um, part of what you know in 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 in, um, in uh, well, certainly in the Abrahamic religions, um, you're supposed to accept death. Uh, because there is an afterlife. It's not the digital afterlife, but there is an afterlife, right? And there is a sense, you know, especially if you live the decent life, right? Though, though it varies, you know, people don't quite know what that means, right? And all that. But nevertheless, the idea is that in some sense, the next life will be a better life, but it won't be a life encumbered by the things uh, that you are encumbered with in this life. Um, and um, and so people often look forward to it, right? They go, they, they die, pe you know, they die peacefully. Uh, and, and, and in fact, uh, this is a very interesting point about, about the shift that takes place in medicine, in terms of the point of medicine as a discipline in the mid 19th century, because until about the 1850s, 1860s, uh, the role of the physician was basically to usher the person through the life cycle. Right. So you're born, you mature, you have children, right. You decline and you die. And so the bed, the so-called bedside manner of the doctor comes from that kind of mentality, right? Where what you're doing is you're facilitating a natural process, which includes death, right? Which includes death. 
Um, and, and you try to make the person as comfortable as possible before they die and all that kind of stuff. What happens in the mid 19th century is you get a, and, and this is where transhumanism in a way begins at this point. Um, you get a much more mechanical notion of the body. And what a mechanical notion of the body means uh, is it is literally a machine. And this is a period in, in the history of physics where people are thinking about, can we have perpetual motion machines, right? That in some sense are able to recycle energy, right? And do not deteriorate over time, right? No entropy, right? Uh, this becomes kind of a hot topic in physics in the second half of the 19th century. And it immediately gets into medicine. And it's at that point that you start to get this idea that the point of medicine is to prevent death, right? Where death is the enemy. Death is no longer the final stage of the life process, right? Uh, but rather it is the other, it is the enemy. It is the thing we need to conquer, right? We need, and, and so, you know, what this corresponds to, uh, is a, a greater emphasis on what, what is sometimes called allopathic medicine, namely where you open up the body a lot, you give the body a lot of foreign substances like pills and things like this, right? You, you jab electrodes into the head and, you know, you give them artificial this and that and the other thing. Uh, and, 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 and so now why, how are you thinking about the body when you do that kind of thing? Not as some kind of organic thing, right? But rather as a machine where you replace the parts, right? And you amplify the parts, right? Uh, and, and you see, Transhumanism sees itself, I think, quite legitimately as the heir to this kind of view of medicine uh, that we have, in fact, had for since the mid 19th century, which has led to, for example, uh, the rise in surgery, right, uh, of all kinds, right, the introduction of pacemakers and artificial uh, uh, organs, um, pharmaceutical industry. Right. Uh, I mean, all, you know, and, and, and more recently, you know, the, uh, the various cyborg implantations that take place, right, right, right. That, 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 you know, and, and, and most of that stuff, right. Took place without transhumanism actually existing as a movement. Right. Science. I mean, yeah. those things kind of predate trans. Right. Right. I mean, that is what medical science has done right over the, the past 150 years. Um, and, and if you look at even, you know, and this is, and it's had very deep kind of effects. And so, especially with the science of biology. Okay. So a good way to see this is to look at Darwin. Darwin is old school biology. Why? Because Darwin is about looking at animals in their native habitats, looking at plants in their native habitats, right? That's all he does, right? He's like, you know, Attenborough, you know, hiding behind the bushes and making <laughs> profound remarks about <laughs> silly creatures. I mean, uh, th that's kind of what Darwin was about, right? Darwin was not about molecular biology, re-engineering the genome, right? He wasn't about any of that stuff. Yet, by the time we get into the early 20th century, that becomes a driving force of the biological sciences. It moves out of the field and into the laboratory, right? Starting with genetics and then the molecular revolution, the more you bring in the physics, physicists and chemists uh, into biology, uh, and that's pretty much what happened. I mean, there's a whole story about this, the Rockefeller Foundation, all sorts of people in the 1930s really start to put a lot of investment, shifting people out of physics and, bio and, and chemistry into biology in order to break open the genome, right? Genes as they were known then. And that's how you got the DNA revolution in the 1950s. And then you get the bioengineering stuff in the 60s and afterwards, okay? Um, and, and this is all part of this kind of mechanistic kind of thing. Uh, and, and it leads, you know, the big, you know, the, the enormous, you know, role of the pharmaceutical industry comes out of this as well. Uh, and the way in which the medical profession is basically being dragged along by this, right? The medical profession is basically subservient to all this stuff, right? Um, that's a, you see that shift, which happens over a course of 150 years, um, is a really big sea change from the bedside manner of the doctor where you're expected to die and your life is being, you know, made comfortable and so forth, right? What you start to get is a lot of anxiety about dying starts to arise in the modern era, right? People feel, you know, uh, you know, people think, am I living long enough, right? We start to measure uh, the, uh, the, the welfare of society by the uh, life expectancy of people. Which is kind of interesting, right? We we sort of take that for granted, right? If the life expectancy of a country is too low, we think, wow, those people, 
those people are living awful lives, but in fact, they often have the highest happiness ratings. Right. Okay. So if you look at happiness ratings around the world, they do not correlate with life expectancy by any means. Okay. Um, yeah, you see, so, so, so the thing is that the, a, a transhumanism basically is surfing that wave, right? That, that kind of mechanistic wave that started to take place right, in the middle of the 19th century. This is what I wanted to chat to you about when you, cause you know, the, the divergence of these points and it seems like yeah. the, the mission creep of people want their jobs to be more important. One of my last guests was uh, Benjamin Applebaum. He was talking about how it, economists caused our modern economy because they were originally in the basement as computers. And they, but they've kind of grown their role and taken over. And it's the same with doctors. They wanted to maybe be more important. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and I think though, it is this kind of, um, molecular biological worldview that really governs it. I mean, the doctors, I think, you know, the medical doctors are kind of dragged along, right? Because you, you end up starting to get, for example, the 19, in, in the 20, see there, there's a, how do you become a medical doctor? Okay. In the early 20th century, you start to get these reports that are commissioned by in various countries that medical doctors cannot be trained any longer as apprentices in the apprentice style from, you know, other GP GPs training other GPs, which was a more common way of doing it, uh, you know, back in the 19th century and, and certainly before that, um, in, instead, what you need is to go to medical school and what is medical school? Medical school is something that's connected to a university. And, and, and why do you want to connect to a university? Because university will teach you science and it, to be a medical doctor, you need science. You need, you, you need to understand the scientific principles on which your treatments are going to be made, right? With the understanding that the emphasis of medical practice is on the treatment, the treatment understood as the thing you're injecting into people, you know, the basis on which you open them up, right? That's kind of what we're talking about. We're not talking about interpersonal mm -hmm. relations with clients or patients anymore. We're, we're talking about, you know, understanding what drugs are ass assigning to them, right? I mean, that then becomes the core feature of medical training starting in the early 20th century. And of course that expands outward, right? So, um, so it's not, you know, so, so when we, you know, people nowadays talk about how big pharma, you know, is basically pressuring all these doctors, you know, to, to, you know, uh, basically, uh, uh use pills for their patients, right? I mean, there's a lot of that kind of discussion, uh, that goes on. That's been going on since the 20th century. That's, that's, that's that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it, and it has to do with the way in which medical doctors are forced to reinterpret who they are as basically applied scientists and the pharmaceutical companies are, as it were, providing you with the state of the art science. Right. So, so that relationship then gets established. Um, and, and, and uh, you see, this is the kind of thing that all these homeopaths and new age people, holistic types right. are kicking against, right? They're kicking against this development. And in many respects, they are much more like the pre 18th. I studied Ayurveda and the, the whole the, the body is one system and we're part of nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That was a much more, and in fact, what's interesting, I had a PhD, I used to, uh, I used to be a professor at Durham university and I have a PhD student, had a PhD student there who's actually published some articles based on this, who was looking at the key period about 1830 to 1860, when the homeopaths and the allopaths in this country kind of coexisted, right? Where, where both were considered part of the medical profession and there wasn't this big showdown which basically led to the homeopaths being expelled temporarily in the medical profession. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. well, and yeah, the NHS actually does accept them, right? And the NHS does fund homeopathy. Um, but the point is that was this crucial period in, in the middle third of the 19th century where, where the, where, where they were kind of compatible, they were kind of accepted and it was quite common to have physicians who had a foot in both camps, but then that. But then as medicine became professionalized, which means scientized, then the separation became clear, certainly by the but beginning of the next, 20th century. What's going to happen? How we, what's the next shift in, in thinking? Well, I think the thing now, and this is where it gets really uh, interesting, right? Is the level, um, there are two, two, there, there are two kinds of in, I mean, interventions then I think the medical profession has to become comfortable with, which at the, because I think the medical profession is quite comfortable with, you know, opening up people's bodies and, 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 and putting in organs and stuff like xenotransplantation, you know, 
pigs' hearts and stuff like that. Um, and, um, and also giving people all kinds of drugs. I mean, you know, they have no problem doing that either. Um, but I do think the issue of the cyborg uh, business, uh, you know, uh, increasing use of, um, you know, electronic, uh, you know, uh, transistorized kinds of implants that may in fact be controlled outside of the body, right? Uh, where there is a kind of, you know, where, where you know, um, because his, historically, um, you know, the thing about the pacemaker was that the person had to learn how to live with it. And it was a, self, it was a kind of part, it becomes part of a self-regulation of the body. That's kind of, you know, with the pacemakers for hearts and stuff like this. But, but if we're, but there, but there's a lot of cyborg stuff in the horizon that would actually enable remote regulation of stuff that's implanted inside of you, especially where the issues are quite subtle, right? Where it would be very difficult for you, you know, at the level of your own consciousness to be able to actually control what's happening in your body. And so there is that you kind think of thing. Be like this, there, there this, is that this, sort of this, this, this divergence because with the vaccine, you're either pro or against, for example. So. Do you think people could, there could be this huge rift in society that some people want these things and others people absolutely not? Yeah, I mean, I think the problem is, is going to be, um, the extent to which a lot of the stuff, a lot of the stuff that now happens in a so-called conventional medical way migrates automatically without consent into cyberspace and becomes externally mm -hmm. controlled. Uh, I mean, because it's not obvious to me that there, there will be consultation as these innovations happen, um, you know, so, I mean, it usually isn't, uh, so, uh, again, it's one of those things. And, and, and I think it's kind of subtle enough that people might not notice it happening, uh, like un what, until example? it's too late. Uh, well, I mean, if it's, I mean, the issue of the, the issue, you know, so like we got, we have already these, these little, these, these things that actually do drive people nuts, like these, uh, NHS apps right, which ping you, right, whenever you've been within 20 miles of a person with COVID, uh, you know, and there goes the rest of your life. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, you know, that's just the beginning, right? You can imagine much subtler versions of stuff like this, right? And especially if what we're talking about, you know, you know, especially as this stuff becomes more sophisticated and they start, you know, you could, you could have like little signals sent to you saying, you know, ah, you know, you've reached your daily calorie input, right? Because now we're very concerned about people becoming obese, right? Uh, and, and there could be all kinds of monitoring taking place of what people are doing and all kinds of incentivizing and conditionalizing of people. I mean, you, you, you look at something like the social credit system in China. I don't know if you follow that, right? The social credit system in China, right, is based, is, 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 it is is predicated on the idea, right, that the that all of the big uh, the big kind of big tech social media out, uh, uh, firms in China are actually partially owned by the government, and so there's an enormous coordination of data between the two, right? This is very different from the Western countries where we're always having friction with the big tech people because they are independent, right? And so we have to negotiate with them. We even to get them to pay taxes, we have to negotiate with them. But in China, there's a kind of public partner, uh, public private partnership arrangement with these things, which means that the government has easy access to all the data that's being collected by all these tech firms. So there's an enormous amount of data about people that can be then used to regulate their behavior. Okay. Um, and, and, uh, and, and they do it, they do it in all kinds of ways, ranging from the subtle to the not so subtle, not so subtle would be like shaming people publicly on the internet who don't pay their taxes, right? So that their neighbors avoid them. Wow. This happens in China, okay, uh, and 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 that's supposed to be an incentive for you to pay your taxes. Um, and uh, and the thing is that this kind of stuff um, could well happen, especially in the name of health, okay. Given that we've got this pinging going on now, right, which admittedly is a very crude version of this, but imagine, you know, especially if you imagine that we're gonna, you know, we're now so virus conscious. Right, that that, and every year there's going to be new viruses. They're going to be all going all over the place. That that there's going to there's going to be a call for increasing medical surveillance, right? Uh, and that and that this will have to be in some sense consumerized, and people will be taught that they need to be responsible, right? And so they we will be made complicit in this operation as part of citizenship, good citizenship, 
Um, and, and, and that, that's how we move toward China. Right. And, and, and that is a kind of, um, that, that is a kind of transhumanizing move. Right. Um, and, 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 I, and, and this raises another point about transhumanism that goes to the point about the longevity. Transhumanists instinctively are hypochondriacs. Okay. Um, right. Uh, and, and so, um, if you look at uh, the way transhumanists have been responding to the pandemic, okay, um, given that transhumanists are um, are libertarians by disposition, you would think they would be against lockdowns and, and all the rest of it. But this is not so true, right? Uh, they are very interested in, in the medical evidence and, 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 you know, and they're following it. And, and, and the people who tend to be very preoccupied with all the changing stats in the medical front tend to be very hypochondriac about these things. Right. They tend to think all the, the numbers as they change, they matter. They become like astrologers, basically. I, I do think there's a sense in which with these kinds of statistics, given their fluctuating nature, that if you fetishize them too much, however rigorous you might seem you being, you're in fact being like an astrologer, right, who fetishizes numbers. Uh, and, and yet you have to know, you, you, in a way, you have to really be, um, if you want to stay sane in what is fundamentally an uncertain situation, you have to be able to be semi-detached from the numbers. You have to say, look, these numbers have a very, they're very iffy with regard to their reliability. Even if they're correct, even if they're accurate, are they indicators of anything long-term? Are they indicators of anything deep? Or are they just the, mo the numbers of the moment, right? So this is to say, I'm not saying numbers are being massaged or hidden or anything. I don't think that's true, at least not in this part of the world. In fact, if anything, we, cr we collect too many numbers. Um, but, but the issue is what are their, what's the significance you see? And I, and I, and I think you need to be kind of semi-detached from this, but the interesting thing is the transhumanists, because they fancy themselves being super scientific, right? They, they end up really fetishizing this stuff and they end up becoming quite, um, quite, you know, they get really incensed by the libertarian people who want to end lockdown. They get, they go over the top. Right. They hated Trump for this, even though they liked him in some other respects. They really hated that he was doing this. People's lives are being jeopardized, you know. Um, and I find that kind of interesting. I find that kind of interesting. But that comes from the sort of scientism, you might say, right? A kind of scientism that in a way is above and beyond a proper scientific attitude. It could be like a new movement because like, you're libertarians. I mean, because the scientists, I heard you say they... They're not against the transhumanisms, but they don't support it because. That's right. That's right. They see it. Yeah. They see it as a speculative so, expansion. But is it, is it, you speak of it now as a, a church, but is it a very broad church? You know, there are all these different sects in there and. Yeah. Yeah, sure. The people who want to live forever in their own bodies are tend to be quite different from the ones who want to upload their consciousness. I mean, um, you know, I mean, certainly in terms of where they're coming from intellectually, um, you know, so, so, uh, yeah. And this goes to the whole issue about, uh, well, there's this fundamental transhumanist principle that under that allows okay. both of these two wings to exist. And that's the idea of morphological freedom, right? That you have the right to exist in whatever form you want. So if you want to live in, you know, if you want to spend, you know, eternity as digital dad, be my guest. Right. But if you want to live in your current body as real dad forever, right. That's cool too. Right. So. So there's a kind of morphological freedom. Um, and in fact, yeah, that's what it's called. It's called morph morphological freedom. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and the interesting thing, and this is the part, this is the aspect of it. I like, uh, is whether you can have free transit between forms. Okay. So in other words, it's not just, they have to make one decision once for all, but can you, you know, like, can you so like right transgender, say, is that what they know, that? Exactly. Bingo. I was wondering when we we're going to get to that. Yes, transgender, transhuman, it's all the same. And in fact, there are people who, Martine Rothblatt is an example. I talk about her in my, uh, in, in, in my Nietzschean meditations book. Uh, yes, indeed. Freedom. Exactly. Maximum freedom at yes, all costs. It, and yes, I, I mean, I, see, I see this is, this is where, um, and, and you see the interesting thing, of course, is if you know anything about libertarians as they normally exist in political life, they actually tend to be, uh, quite biologically conservative, um, which, which is interesting, right? They tend, they tend not, I mean, some of them support transgender, but a lot of them believe, you know, like Jordan Peterson, right? Jordan Peterson is a biological essential, basically, right? Uh, and, and, 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, but if you're transhumanist, it seems to me, yes, the transgender thing ought to be on your radar as being part of the same thing, because transgender is about morphological freedom. Where I think it becomes controversial, even in that community, um, is the idea of whether you can flip back and forth, right? Because, because you know, like if you remember back in the days um, when, when homosexuality was kind of an issue, right? Uh, Right. There, 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 there were some people who said, you know, your, 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 uh, your sexual preference was a choice. Right. Um, and, and, and when people said that, right, uh, uh, the suggestion was often kind of like a once in of a lifetime choice or, or, or can you yeah. flip back and forth? Right. And, and of course, people didn't like the idea of sexual preference as a choice because they thought it's flipping back and forth, which it is. It, it, it probably is. Um, but, but they didn't like that. So what instead you had was a lot of these homosexual activists. Now, I'm not talking about the opponents of the homosexuals. I'm talking about the activists talking about biological basis for homosexuality. Right? You know about that, right? Right? That, that it is a, re, you know, so in other words, we want to normalize homosexuality as a biological fact about people, whatever 10% of the population is always going to be homosexual, right? I mean, these numbers got tossed around uh, at the time, right? As part of the way of showing that it is not a uh, psychiatric condition, right? Which was kind of how it was defined actually until the 1960s. Um, and, and, but see, these are very different views, right? I mean, these are very different views about homosexuality and the transgender thing has the same kind of thing going on as well, right? Where, where you know, uh, and people find the moral problem with those who we, would, would like to fight right back and forth. One year on one team and on the other next year. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, this is the thing, right? You get all that jazz going on. I know. And there's some people, right? I mean, now, you know, you get some people because everybody likes to think in terms of apartheid when it gets, gets the tricky things. Like, we need a transgender. But not just one. Well, you know, one team. <laughs> <laughs> For one, just transgender the people. Right? Just like race. <laughs> depending on. Yeah, I mean, that's not going to happen. I mean, but the, but, but the point is that there are people who think that that's the only way to solve this politically. But it is a political can of worms, okay? But my view is that, that the, the logic of transhumanism is to support transgender in the morphologically free sense where you are able to go back and forth. I believe that is the logically consistent Well, kind of it's position. also in reincarnation. Um, and again... From my metaphysics study, we are reborn man, reborn woman, reborn real woman. Yeah, well, this is... Yeah, yeah. And, and this is why I think transhumanism is ultimately a kind of theological position, right? It's, it's about recovering the spirit. It should right? be. It's about recovering the spirit yeah. in its multiple embodiments. That's a, that, I think that, that ends up being the driving force and a lot of the sensibilities that are associated with it can be explained that way, much more so than talking about the human animal. Maybe these transhumans, they just need story. to understand that the system we already have is perfect and just more of an acceptance. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, we, it's... Well, let's put it this way. We, as far as things like transgender is concerned, right, and a lot of these other issues, they're, they're morally very fraught issues, right? We don't live, we don't, we, we live in a world where I do think that that the, uh, the the potential for being a human being is still quite. I didn't mean the system. I didn't mean the system as in society. Right? I, mean, I mean the system as in the spiritual process that we that we live through. Yeah, sure. It, it at that level, yes, but I do think. Um, there is going to be, you know, the, the, the default settings for what a human being can be, I think, are still pretty constrained, notwithstanding all of the, I mean, look how long it took, right, to get anything approaching gender equality or racial equality, and that's not perfect at all by any means, but look how long that took, and the differences there, you know, are relatively minor compared to what transhumanism is putting on the table. You know, transhumanism is act, you know, is actually calling for a much broader range of tolerance. You know, I mean, um, I mean that 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 connects to another issue. I don't know how much longer you want to go on with this, but but the point is, if transhumanism actually were to kind of get its way in some sense, in that it is possible to live forever, let's say in your biological body or whatever, um, then will that kind of a world tolerate the people who don't want to do it? Um, you see, because that's the other side of the coin too, if this stuff actually gets pulled off, um, 
And that's one of the things that people worry about who don't, who are concerned about transhumanism, right? Is, uh, you know, when they talk about it as being a kind of elite conspiracy, right? Uh, is the, is because a lot of transhumanist rhetoric, uh, operates on the assumption that people, people will just want this once it's made possible, right? Once people can live forever, everyone will choose it. This is why they don't confront the suicide, euthanasia, death issue. They don't take it seriously because they don't believe anyone would go for it. They believe that once that pe everyone would want to live forever, right? And the only reason why people don't want to live forever is because they're worried about the pain and the suffering which has to do with the debilitating illnesses. But if those things don't exist either, right? Cause we've solved those issues, right? No cancer, whatever, no Alzheimer's, none of that jazz, right? Then people just want to carry on. Now that's rubbish. I think that's completely simple minded way of thinking, but nevertheless, I think a lot of transhumanists believe that, which means what happens when you get the inevitable culture clash between the human, the humans 2.0 and the humans 1.0, right? Uh, the ones who don't want to go there. Will they be allowed or will they be put on reservations? <laughs> right. I mean, you know, as endangered species. That sounds like a movie. It's a like movie. Those gorillas, right? Like those gorillas. Ancestors, our evolutionary ancestors. We've got to protect those little creatures. Well, we'll have to protect the human, the human 1.0 people too. <laughs> I mean, their, their population would have to be controlled in some way. Well, that's true. Yeah, you don't want them proliferating the normal way. That's right. That's right. So you don't put the Catholic Church in church. <laughs> <laughs> and would you like to live forever, Steve? I actually think the digital dad. Oh, you you're in thing. that camp. Um, I'm so. I mean, let's put it this way. Um, I mean, if you're if you if you do think about this stuff, and you know, and you're and you're and you're sort of philosophically minded person. I guess I'm, I've always been of the view, uh, that, that, uh, you've got to have a point to stick around that you really do need a point to stick around that one shouldn't just presume that you're entitled to take up space. Um, so, so, uh, you know, as long as I think I have a point to stick around, I, I will stick around a lot, but at some point I may want to, uh, you know, uh, transmigrate or do something else. Um, you know, so, so I, I keep an open mind about these things. But I don't think, um, I mean, you know, I do think it's a, it's a live issue. Okay. If I can live forever, mm -hmm. what am I doing with it? You know, one thing, one thing that, that, that I, I have suggested in the past with regard to people who do have this option of living indefinitely is that they ought to be put on a spaceship and, and kind of allowed to kind of circulate around the cosmos, you know, kind of a <laughs> Elon Musk style kind of, that's where he'd be, he'd be very well placed for that send them away, uh, permanently and, and have them, you know, play Star Trek, right? Visit all kinds of new world, settle places, right? Chart all kinds of uncharted territories and stuff like that, you know, get some new experience, right? This kind of thing, uh, but not have them hang around Earth. You know, I mean, that, that would be, that would kind of be my view. I mean, so that if we started to get, let's say a kind of critical mass of people who were able to live forever. I would really strongly suggest they be offloaded from earth, uh, and, and, and travel around the, I mean, given that, you know, guys like Musk are, are going to be developing all of this kind of commercial spacecraft and can go all over the place, becoming more efficient and so forth. I mean, they're doing it on the back of the rain money, right? That by the time we get to the year, you know, 2100, um, it's likely that there'll be some pretty good ships out there. Right. Uh, and, and, and if we got people living forever, they should be put on them and sent off and that the earth should be for the people who want to live a finite life. That's one, one view I have. I think I, if, if I lived forever, I definitely, I'd actually want to have new places to visit. Yeah. Yeah. I'd want more, to... <laughs> you don't want to, you know, it's like Islington is only so exciting. I mean, <laughs> in town is only so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> You know, so, so, I mean, yeah, exactly. So that's kind of what I, I, but, but you see, we, we do need to think about stuff like that, right? We, we already need to think about stuff about the culture clashes that could arise and all the rest, the intergenerational conflicts, all, all these kinds of things. We need to be thinking about them now and, and to be mindful of all these other things that are happening too. So what Elon Musk is doing is quite significant, right? There are all these other things that are happening 
that are kind of related. And, and we need a much more joined up space to think about what the long term, you know, horizons are, what kinds of, you know, moral and, and political That's why I have like, yeah. Sure. <laughs> that, no, I, I actually have, you know, my PhD students, I get them very much turned on to this kind of stuff. I have one PhD student who actually did something on the digital afterlife stuff because um, she actually put together a little digital afterlife thing for her father when he died. Uh, and so she got really into this in a big way. Um, so I do try to get the students are, are, are actually very attracted to this topic, uh, because it is, first of all, what it does is it provides another kind of space for thinking about politics beyond the one that we are, you know, the ones that we're currently mired in, because I think for the younger generation, you know, the way in which politics gets played out on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, parliamentary politics, this kind of politics right, uh, is really uh, not very inspiring to students. Uh, they're not really connected any longer with the kinds of ideologies that you might say animate a lot of the stuff that goes on in conventional politics. Um, and, and so they, they, this is why they also look at the environment very seriously, right? They, they take the environment as a kind of locus uh, for political action. And in fact, I do think, I mean, this is one thing I do talk about in several of my writings, that the environment, what I call the downwingers, right? The people who are focused on earth, right? Um, that they and the transhumanists who I call upwingers are, are, are bound to be the next kind of conflict, right? Because the transhumanists basically think that the whole cosmos is the human oyster, right? And that we can just expand indefinitely. And if, if we trash the planet, we've always got Alpha Centauri to go to, you know, uh, and, and whereas the, you know, whereas these eco warriors think, you know, it's the earth or nothing, Right. And, and that the earth has got to be the thing we save. And even if it means we have to kill a few transhumanists in the process, you know, Hey, you know, that's the way it goes. Um, you remember that movie, uh, from a few years ago, transcendence, the Johnny Depp movie. I don't know if you ever saw that movie. So, so it's, it's based, basically it's loosely based on Ray Kurzweil, who's very keen on uploading consciousness and Johnny Depp plays this character and he get and, and, and he, he and, and and his, uh, his facility, which is, which is a, on the verge of uploading a monkey's brain into a computer, right. Gets vandalized by eco warriors who end up shooting him. And he has a limited amount of time before he's going to die. And so his girlfriend hooks him up and hook gets him uploaded into a machine. And then he becomes this cosmic menace. Um, you know, uh, and, 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 and I think that the Hollywood guys have got it kind of right there where in the sense that the eco warriors, you know, protecting those poor monkeys who have electrodes in them, right. All these animals that might be experimented on, right. Um, that they are the menace. So it's what these transhumanists want to do. It's not this left, right, right transhumanists anymore. It's this, this, you know, I mean, uh, no, it's up, down, it's up, down. That's the point. It's up, down. It's a 90 degree turn. Uh, and no, this uh, is too it's both it's too both. inspiring it's, it's just i know i think we're just going <laughs> to get you on another episode and uh i also wanted to ask you about um post-truth and you know, you're oh jesus <laughs> I think information over i think we've, we've got a song then about <laughs> transhumanism and but, but that's fascinating the up down yeah the, yeah yeah the, yeah, yeah. The, this you have hollywood script writers call you often for ideas or they uh no, no. I mean, I think some of these Hollywood guys kind of get it already when you see kind of the way in which the dynamics of a lot of these of films play out. You know, well, you know, the playwrights example, like Plato you know? and Aristotle, the playwrights of the heard you talking. So they're the people who. Oh yeah. Well, this. Is, well, you know, let, you know, uh, I, uh, I, um, you, you know, Peter Thiel, the uh, the, the yeah, venture Peter. capitalist. You heard of him. At, Silicon Valley capitalist, right? And he's a big kind of uh, supporter of transhumanism. He's into cryonics. Um, and he want, I, I interviewed him once. Uh, and uh, he, uh, he, one of the things that he hates the most about Hollywood is not that they don't, he thinks they actually are, you know, they actually are very good in a sense in, in really planting a lot of these ideas in people's minds and making them seem very vivid except that they're always dystopic. Mm. This is the thing he doesn't like, right? That, they, that they're always dystopic, right? Whether we're talking about like a Elysium with Matt Damon, if you remember that film from a few years ago, right? There are all these films that are actually very, very intellectually 
quite smart. They kind of get the emerging conflicts right, you know, but except, right, that they're always against right. whoever the transhumanist is, right? The transhumanists are always the bad guys. They are the agents of mega capital, right? They have Darth Vader on their side, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, and, and, and so Peter Thiel said, you know, Hollywood needs to have people right, who are able to present things just as vivid, just as exciting, but in a, you know, with a more pro-trans. But they're the play ranks who are bringing, you know, they're bringing the, the canaries in the coal mine or ringing the bell and saying, this is, this could happen. This is dangerous. Well, it's interesting. You know, no, no, disaster sells. I mean, people, you know, people love to see these, 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 these horrific things, right? I mean, um, and, and, and so it, it, it does alert people. So people are, so there's quite a, especially in the younger generation, there's quite a lot of awareness of all this stuff going on. You know, mm -hmm. Gattaca, if you remember that film from oh, over 20 years ago now, right? I mean, there are all these films which really implant something in people's minds, right? About the way the future is going, but they're always dystopic, right? I mean, um, and, and so you wonder what the long-term effect is going to be. Now, it might be actually, you know, the positive thing to say is it might instill a kind of critical consciousness so people aren't gullible right so so you know uh, you know so so in a sense these kinds of arguments that I, I i was saying that we need to have about the value of life and death and all this kind of stuff people may actually be prepared for these arguments and be able to think about you know these highly developed through history yeah, that, that's always been kind of the idea. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think that that's, yeah. So, so in this regard, uh, it, it may be what these people are doing is they are actually schooling the population to be critical and not to be mm. too wowed, right? Uh, I mean, there'll always be, as it were, people like Elon Musk will always have their cult, right? But the point is, um, you know, there's a kind of, buffer around it that's being created by these more dystopic versions right and that might that might be good i mean that might you know so so peter Thiel, you know i understand where he's coming from on this but it it, it may be uh that that uh this ends up serving to raise pretty rich enough he can pay for a movie to be done if he wants it you know, to have happy ending well i kind of wonder why he hasn't done it himself right but uh, you know have his own movie studio and churn out this stuff but you see, guys like Elon Musk, right? In a sense, they have their own best PR, right? These guys don't need movies. They just they just send rockets into space, right? I mean, they do the real thing. <laughs> they don't need Hollywood, right? And and as long as their rockets succeed, they don't, yeah. you know. And even if they don't, you know, they don't succeed sometimes, right? Uh, you know, that's like a thriller. That's you're living through a thriller through Elon Musk's investments. You know, I mean, so you don't need a Hollywood movie. So maybe that's the positive side of the story. Okay, well, uh, <laughs> we just have to continue this another time, I think. Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm probably, that song, by the way. Holly, <laughs> there. <laughs> songwriter. So we're gonna. <laughs> you all set, Holly? You got it. You got it. I get it. I get it. I just, you're uh, down there. You made it. I'm it. I did write some, I wrote little, little yeah. quotes that I like and stuff like that. But, um, Just make yeah, sure we get a copy, see it. <laughs> yeah. sign off a copyright and any of his ideas, if we put them in the song. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. There's just a lot to sort of oh. whittle down into a song. Sure, of course. That's part of it. Sort of the, the picking <laughs> and choosing. You're not doing <laughs> a <laughs> I could do an opera if we have to. <laughs> I would go and see that opera, actually. That would be a... Transhuman the opera. Yeah. There's an idea. It is actually interesting. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Just don't no. let Andrew Lloyd Webber get hold of <laughs> <laughs> You know what? <laughs> no, no. It'll be very schmaltzy. <laughs> oh, this has been great. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, I look forward so to I. the finished product. Yes, yeah, I look forward to starting. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yep. guys. So we're, we're starting off now. That's that we're done. Thanks, Steve. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, Steve. Well, thank you. Thank you, bye -bye, guys. Steve. Right. Good luck. And bye bye. Bye. <laughs> nice to meet you. Wow, Holly. Wow. Did you did you get all that? Yeah. Yeah. That's very. I got quite a bit of it. I think I was sort of 
more listening than um than chatting but i mean i think there's quite a lot to sort of um like this yeah it's like it's a lot it's a lot to work with it's just figuring out sort of nice but i mean i don't know how you sort of want to go about it um whether you want because i know there are, you said sort of different options about how to um i guess like how we can sort of go with the song and stuff like that but i'm happy to sort of um sort of mess around with a few things and just um i don't know get some lyrics and 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 stuff down and just see if i can get guitar but i mean um yeah if i try and do that maybe first and then uh see yeah but it's it, yeah it's just sort of like i want to re-listen to it and then get a few sort of quotes and yeah, oh, yeah. there's a lot of cool words in it i don't know for me it's always like it's <laughs> starting with the words i think um yeah but i mean how would you normally do it with people oh yeah yeah go away and have 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 a digest about digest it and see what you come up with mm -hmm. and um yeah and then we can go into the production i mean do you have can you record there or what what sort of production because we have everything here so oh right yeah i can record i mean i'm not great sort of the tech tech stuff but I, my guitarist is quite good so okay. i can probably go around his and and um, like obviously if the quality that I've recorded isn't great I can go around his and he he knows how to do it sort of really nice sounding and stuff um okay. so yeah but I mean I can sort of do try and figure out a draft to it thing but I don't know if you if you had like words or sort of ideas that you you sort of wanted to add in then do send me stuff because I mean I'm quite I don't know yeah I like that sort of uh, uh just brainstorming in the beginning and stuff but um yeah, I'll, I guess I'll just listen through it again and, and see. Uh, there's enough there for like several songs, but uh, I think I'll just try and pick out the best bit. Yeah, I had to cut him off. I hope I wasn't rude, but... Uh, no, no, it's like... Yeah, it's it just overload. That's the thing. I, it can be hard sort of to sort of edit it down. That interest, up, that up-down idea of politics as well and, the you know, the way that... Because we've always understood, you know, mm -hmm. left-right. Uh, that was fascinating as well, but... Uh, yeah. But yeah, I have to focus, otherwise it's going to be too too much. Yeah, well, I love sort of like that sci-fi kind of stuff. So it's like I'm thinking really like maybe not dystopian. I'm going to try not to do it like that way. But it's just sort of that that kind of um, I don't know, I don't know that kind of theme in it. You know, that it's very like science fictiony sort of text stuff and things and what the meaning. How are we human? Sort of mm -hmm. how do we stay human amongst all that? What is human? Yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 exactly what is human and stuff which i i think that was the m most interesting bit of all the things we talked like and like you said that running thread throughout mm. like even though like all this technology comes in and stuff like that how, are, would we still be human in a way and how do we stay human if we're like transhumanist and living forever and stuff like that so yeah maybe i'll go along that train <laughs> well i can hear the i can hear it flowing out of you already i'm, just, I'm really so excited this is going to be amazing yes i'm excited well thanks for having me and um yeah yeah thanks for um sort of uh leading it a bit because uh, i think i got a bit i wasn't sure when to come in and stuff but uh, yeah <laughs> you did a great job yeah it was wonderful i had a, had a great time so oh, awesome well thanks thanks so much jack um yeah and uh, uh i'll keep you updated with stuff I might just this week, my, my girlfriend's leaving, her dad's sort of ill in America. So I might um, uh, just leave this week and then get everything, get started on everything next week. Sure, so. sure. Sometimes it's good to just sit down now for the next hour and just mm -hmm. see if anything yeah. comes. Yeah. This is like the golden time. Yeah, yeah. Because. Um, yeah, that's the thing. You've some, got... Then you've got something to come. Just yeah. an, even if it's just one line or one chord, just mm -hmm. sometimes. You've got to come back to it while well, it's hot. If you come back to it cold, yeah. sometimes is um, just that little tip. Yeah, yeah. No, I'll definitely do that. And are you on WhatsApp as well? Like, and uh, I am. Yeah. On... Um, I'll send you my number. Um, and then, okay. and then just I guess like WhatsApp me, and then I'll yeah. Um, but I'll keep you updated. And if I have like a little sort of really drafty version, I'll send it over. Um, just and sure. then just as we go. But I mean, do tell me if there's things that I can sort of change and stuff like that. I'm usually, I'm like a bare bones person. Like I like making like the bare bones or something. And then obviously when we've had guys who like are good at the music side of things, they come in and put all that sort of stuff. But then also our vocals together would be cool. I'm going to keep that in mind. Sort Super of. cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so exciting. Collaboration is 
just it makes it so much more interesting. I know, I know. I'm very, like, uh, yeah, I'm very excited about this. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Uh, well, lovely to meet you in the uh, cyberspace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, this is this isn't me. This is just an uh, avatar. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's your digital <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Holly. Take care then. You too. Bye. Chat later. Yeah. Bye bye. Young bodies burn in the heat of the sun. A river wraps into a snake. The scales fall away. for listening hope you enjoyed the show and the song if you want to hear the song again it's available on all music streaming services or for a one dollar download from podsongs.com you can also subscribe there for our newsletter for all other news and updates a big thanks to our musical production team here in italy maurizio sanicola massimino vozza and luigi falcione and my researcher dori verbo please help us by sending this episode to your friends, sharing it on social media, and reviewing it wherever you can. I also have another show to listen to. It's called The Mystic Cast, and it's about spirituality, UFOs, mysticism, the occult, and the Ethereum Society, the teachings of which led me to start this project, serving the servers, helping those who help others. Thanks again for tuning in. Have a great day.